Well, I am super excited about this episode. One of my favorite people on the planet, Jesus Trejo, he's a comic, is one of the nicest people ever is my guest. And he has written a children's book called Papa's Magical Water Jug Clock. Here it is. You can buy it um, wherever you buy books, but he recommends you buy it from a place called bookshop.org. They source book sales from local bookstores, so it helps your local bookstore stay in business. Um, That's bookshop.org. Papa's Magical Water Jug Clock. Um, Jesus' dad was a gardener, and I think this is about going to work with his dad. And what a great story. What a great message. Um, I can't wait to read it. I was so happy to talk to him. We talked about so many things about um, he's been a caregiver for both of his parents for a while. We talked about that. His mom has some mental illness, and we talked about what it was like growing up as a child with a parent that has some mental challenges. He used to work in the field of autism with uh, autistic children. We talk about that. Um, We discovered a couple things about ourselves in this podcast. And uh, yeah, he's taking a little break from stand up until August to promote this book. But if you're interested in seeing him live, and I highly recommend it, he's a really great comic. He used to open for Bird, and now he's headlining uh, uh, headlining clubs himself. You can go to JesusTrejo.com. That's J-E-S-U-S-T-R-E-J-O.com and check out his calendar and catch him if he's in your city because not only is he really, really funny, he's a really great person. So, yep. Yeah. Buy his book, Papa's Magical Water Jug Clock. Go check him out live. And I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I do. Oh, the book comes out June 6th. And if you haven't already seen The Machine, go see The Machine in theaters. It's called The Machine.movie. And catch it if you can, because it's really something to see in a movie theater. It's an action comedy. I'm really proud of Bert. I'm really proud of the movie. So June 6th, buy Jesus's book and go see The Machine. I hope you enjoy this episode with me and Jesus Trejo. How have you been? I'm good. I've, 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 I've been good. It's great to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Congratulations on all your guys' success. Thank it's uh, you. so cool. Um, I know. I miss seeing you. Yeah, it's uh, you outgrew us though. That's what you're supposed to do. I just been on the road a little bit, you know. It's like I've, I'm excited to get out there and you know develop and um, you know work the hour, yeah. uh, work on this project, that project. So it's it's cool, you know. It's uh yeah, it's all been a learning experience, but very very awesome, you know, to really have that opportunity to you know develop and express myself and get all the art out there and yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So you've been touring, uh, you're a headlining everywhere, aren't you? Yeah, I've been on the road pretty heavy. I mean, the first week was, uh, I started off in Toledo, Ohio this year. Oh, so Ohio's I, great. How was I it like for it. You? No, it was, it was great. Good. We did, uh, I did, uh, I did the weekend there and then just kind of been bouncing around and yeah, I've been on the road most weeks. That's great. Uh, which is great, you know, coming back and rewriting and that kind of thing. Hopefully I'll be able to record a special uh this year yeah you know, hopefully in august I'll, i'm gonna self-produce it kind of thing um but I'm, I'm i'm really excited i feel like the hour got to a nice place where you know i just want to like get it out i'm like i never want to do those jokes again yeah and i want to work on the next thing and you know have that hour re- reflect where i'm at now in life totally yeah. yeah isn't it funny how you grow into and out of material it's so funny because it's like the inspiration you know, with the pandemic and everything, the the first hour came out in 2020. I, I taped it in in uh, November 2nd, 2019 at the at the El Portada Theater in, in, in North Hollywood. And, uh, you know, coming out of it is like I, I, I wanted to do something different, you mm-hmm. know, and I dove in and I created this thing that's changed a bunch. But now it's like, OK, I think I got it. And now this hour is like I feel like I outgrew it. Uh huh. You know, it's like I'm 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 so happy and excited to do it, but it feels like like I want to do something else now. I want to I want to see what this third hour might look like. Right. That's yeah. exciting. Yeah. So it's it, it's cool. You know, it's like I, I feel as a comic, you know, I'm, I mature more and more with with every set, you know, sometimes, um, you know, finding what doesn't work. Maybe revisiting old premises, I think, is really fun for me mm-hmm. and, and, and figuring out how to do it as a more mature comic that maybe I couldn't see. 
uh, certain things as a younger comic with that premise. So, I mean, that's really fun to do as well. That and life experiences you've had along the way uh, inform a lot of that too, don't they? A hundred percent. Yeah. I, I talk a lot, a lot about, um, and this hour that hopefully I'm, I'm going to record in August. It's like, I talk a lot about like going to the doctor and what, you know, how important that is. And, mm-hmm. you know, being a caregiver for so long, I was always in the driver's seat of, Hey mom, do this. Hey dad, do that. You know, let's, you know, make sure you're taking care of your health and that kind of thing. And it's like, sometimes you lose track of your, of, of, of your own, you know, it's like, cause you, you know, my priority has always been to take care of my parents. So it's like now to be in the hot seat, you're like, Oh man, it's like, none of this is fun. And, you know, you, you, you find this new kind of like understanding for my parents and all the doctor visits and that kind of thing is like, oh man. So I explore that in this next hour and yeah, I'm excited to put it out there. That's good. Do you, can we talk about your parents? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So you've, your parents, tell me again what, uh, you've taken care of your parents mm-hmm. and they need a lot of care, right? Yeah. Are they, are they still here? Yeah, yeah, they're okay, still good. here. Uh, mom is uh, quite sick, you is know. She? Yeah, you know, life life is is interesting that way. Um, How do you do that on the road? Do you have somebody that helps when you're gone? You have yeah, to. Yeah, I'm. I'm very grateful that I I, I finally have a, a caregiver. You know, we had a care a, a caregiver that was with us for like about a year. Mm-hmm. You know, and. Um, now we have a different one that kind of joined joined us maybe uh, two months ago, and uh, her name is Eva, and she's uh, wonderful. And um, you know, I'm very lucky and, and grateful to be in a place where there's a caregiver now, and I could, I can, you know, focus a little more on on, on my stand up. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm I'm still I'm still in five places at once, but it's like it does help to have that kind of coverage at home where sure. I know if something's there, I can get a phone call. Um, I can handle most of it from the road. You know, I can send stuff now in the age of phones. It's like, how, how, how amazing is it that, you know, you have a uh, grocery store apps or food thing where they could drop off. Or if you need something from a re- uh, a regular retail store, you can have that ship. So it really helps. Like I'm on my phone a lot, but having a caregiver was really awesome. And, you know, it's like being a caregiver for, for so long, I never had that support and, you know, being an only child, that's tough, you yes. know? Um, yeah, so it's been, it's been, um, uh, yeah, it's like taking care of my parents. Uh, you know, we did a documentary with ARP years ago called care to laugh. Mm-hmm. And I had been doing a lot of work with ARP and, um, you know, around disrupt ageism. It was a initiative that they had, but, you know, talking about like caregiving in particular, and I've done a lot of work with them, you know, last year we did a kind of like a tour around different cities, um, you know, around, caregiving Mm -hmm. and uh you know there was a lot of caregivers and caregivers who would come out to the show and you know i got to show my experience i think that that audience uh, like really related you know it's like everything from buying diapers and having to change a loved one you know it's like you know being a caregiver comes in the form of um maybe a a a kid that they may have with special needs or Mm -hmm. an elderly loved one or an accident that kind of thing so it's like caregiving kind of you know, and to be up there as a like a Latino male, which is not the typical profile that you would see, but mm-hmm. it's like things are changing. You know, I'm a millennial male Latino caregiver. It's not somebody who you, you would associate right away in mm-hmm. that space. But I can talk to my experience and it really resonated. It was really cool. But um, again, going back to my parents, it's really cool that I'm I'm able to make sure they're they're taken care of and. Uh, my dad is, you know, a lot better now. He is. Yeah, he. So it's, it's like he had cancer, like uh, colon cancer, like a while ago, and um, you know, he's also a big supporter of 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 my comedy and also helping me with my mom because he's the one that's kind of the in between between my mom and the caregiver. So he's there on the day to day, and then you know, my mom is, you know, it's like dementia and mm. you know, it's like bipolar and schizophrenic you know the whole book you know you, oh, you know goodness. even you know the doctor even meant there's some talks of like parkinson's it's like you know she got the whole book but man my mom's a she's a tough one man she's given the one two punch i mean she's i, I, I mean i like with no reservation do i say like she's the strongest person i've ever met i, wow. mean, I mean she is uh she's not yeah she's not going down without a fight and she's uh yeah so now do you think you've always been a caregiver since you were really little? <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, because it's funny. It's like, I think the caregiver thing kind of comes um, at, even earlier than like any health problems, right? It's mm-hmm. like, 
you know, being a first generation, you know, helping mom and dad with paperwork. Mm. Um, I didn't have command of the English language till fifth grade, right? So it's like- Were you, you not born here? I was born here, Long Beach, California. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Yeah, I was born here, but it's like I was not exposed to English speaking as much. I mean, my cousins and that kind of thing. So it's like whatever version of English that I had and then going to school, you eventually start to pick it up. But to really say, I was like, oh man, I was on, like, I really understand English would be fifth grade. I, I was in ESL classes up until like, I, I wanted to opt out of it in high school because I still was in ESL. I'm like, I'm done with this. Like, I, <laughs> like give me the regular class, you know? Right? So I took the test and I got out of it in ninth grade. But um, but yeah, there was no no push to get me out of it. They were like, you're ESL. It's like, oh no, I think I want to get out of this. I think I got it by ninth grade, you know? Right. Uh, but yeah, it's like helping parents with like something as simple as um, filling out a Medi-Cal application, mm. you know, for health insurance early on going to the doctor with my mom for just a regular checkup, you know, as a kid having to translate these conversations that as a kid, you're like, I don't want to hear or yeah. have, be here for this conversation, you know? So you're translating things back and forth. And I look back and I laugh because I'm like, I've, I, I probably translated things so wrong, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. My dad would, would, would uh, tease me. He would say, he's like, because that in between kind of purgatory stage of like not knowing how to speak a language and being in a like um you know spanish is my first language but i'm learning english so there's that in between mm -hmm. my dad was like you're gonna end up mute like you can't speak either language you know <laughs> <laughs> so it's like which one do you pick so it's like i don't know eventually english became my dominant language that i think in now, oh, okay so. and your dad played golf where'd you learn how to play golf Oh, I played golf at a, um, so my godfather worked at a, a golf course in, um, in Palos Verdes. And uh, when I was in college, uh, I was looking for a job and he got me a job there working the, the, the cart barn, yeah. you know, working on the carts and that kind of thing. And then uh, the uh, range, I would go pick up balls in the little truck. And um, yeah, that's where I learned there was a, there was a pro there. Uh, the course pro, he would teach lessons. Mm -hmm. And and the deal was um, if I, you know, set up all the balls for his classes, you know, cleaned them and, you know, had the stations ready that on Sundays I would have a, a 30 minute free lesson. So I did that all week just so I can get that 30 minute free lesson. Um, it was, yeah, it was really cool. And that's kind of where I learned, you know, it's just going out there and every club that I have in my bag has been given to me by one of, one of the regulars at one point in time during my time there. So I assembled this bag that, it's so dear to me. I still have it, you know? Yeah, so. it's meaningful. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. My dad's a landscaper, so okay. he, he worked in Palos Verdes, and my mom cleaned houses mm -hmm. and took care of kids in the same area of Palos Verdes. They met up there. Oh, they did? Yeah. Are they, were they, are they, were they born here? No, uh, Mexico. My dad's from Sinaloa. Okay. And then uh, my mom's from Jalisco. And they met here? Yeah, they met here in uh, Palos Verdes. In How Norway. did they get here from... Mexico. Uh, they they crossed the border. My dad, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they crossed the border, and my dad had a quite the quite the stories. Like you know, he got jammed up pretty like like a bunch of times before he came through. He's he like, did what do you mean he got jammed up? Well, you know, you get caught crossing the border oh, illegally. Caught. You know, it's like so he got jammed up at the border a couple of times, and um, I think he said like like almost like a dozen times. Wow. So it's like you know he was you know, no idea or nothing. So we're like, Hey, where are you from? And he's like, Oh, I'm from here, you know, Tijuana. So they opened the door and we're like, get out of here. Instead of having him go all the way back to Sinaloa. Right. My dad would just say, Oh, I'm, I'm from here in Tijuana. So it's like, he, he would just stay there and he kept trying and trying. It took him a couple of weeks to finally like make it, make it across. And, you know, it's like when we, uh, my parents are U S citizens now, you know, but it's like, like, I remember when we would go visit uh, TJ, you know, we would go down there, uh, you know, when I was in middle school, we went down there quite a bit. You know, he would show me the 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 places he had to stay while the next person came and picked them up and eventually brought them to L.A. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, I slept in, you know, that area. There's a ditch over there. It's like we all kind of just hid there overnight. It's like Crazy. the stories my dad has is like so gnarly. And why did he want to come here so badly? What was his to work, circumstance for work? To work, you know, to provide for his family. You know, his mother was elderly. His father passed at a young age. So it's like his his whole goal in life was to, you know, provide for his family back home. He had, you know, siblings and a family, you know, back home too, which, you know, that's a, 
that's a whole nother uh, story. But he had a family down there that he needed to take care of. And you mean he had a, another wife or? Yeah. Oh, he did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he had a, like a whole family down there and kids. And have you met any of them? Yeah, I have. You yeah, have? Yeah, I've, I've met some of my half siblings and uh, yeah, they're not yeah, good people. You know, That's we great. don't have a, as much a, of a relationship per se, but yeah, yeah, I've, I've met, I've, I've met uh, most of them. That's cool. Yeah, there's a bunch of them for sure. That's so crazy. Yeah, crazy. So he came here and then how did your mom get here? Uh, she, she has an interesting story. I, I, if I remember it correctly, she, she was working for a doctor, right? She was, uh, she was a nanny. Uh, she lived with the family full time, took care of the kids and, uh, they would come into the U S quite a bit, you know? And, and so they would go back and forth and eventually she came across and then just kind of stayed and when, you know, kind of went off the grid and then eventually had to kind of you know, do the paperwork and, you know, prove that she was working and that kind of stuff, like what happened. And uh, so that took a, like a while to kind of establish, but you know, she, yeah, she was working for this uh, Mexican doctor that would come to the States uh, quite often. Mm. Yeah. And just stayed. And then, and, and she just kind of went off and did her own thing and, you know, lost contact with the doctor. She just kind of like left. Um, yeah. That, that's kind of the story that my mom would tell me. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so when you were a kid, cause my mom has, um, I, my mom's never been diagnosed, but I believe mm. my mom has some mental illness. Um, and I, as a child knew that something was off, oh, interesting. um, from really young, mm. like I never, uh, really felt completely safe with her and mm. I never really trusted her because she had like a, uh, personality disorder stuff. Got so, it. uh, you know. That couch is blue today, but to tomorrow that couch is green. And yeah. if you don't think it's green, then you're in big trouble. And so I just never really trusted her. Um, mm. But I sensed it really young. Was your mom, did your mom have any of that stuff really young, bipolar and schizophrenia? Or in, did it come in later? In retrospect, like, like when we look back, I, I do find times in which exactly what you're explaining. You know, there was, where there was times where it's like if you agreed with her or didn't, it was kind of like, I think it really shaped, you know, my personality a lot because it's like, you, you know, uh, not liking confrontation, you know, mm -hmm. going along with it, I think was, was a big thing. So what you just described, I'm like, yeah, there was moments of that. Mm -hmm. um, my mom had a lot of mood swings too, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, that was like, like a big thing. She was a very sweet woman. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, I mean, just, um, Oh, my mom was super fun. Yeah. You know, the, that's the, I think the confusing thing, especially for children, when you have a parent that has some kind of real mental problem, it's not my mom's fault that she had these problems. I don't even blame her now as an, I haven't blamed her for years, you mm -hmm. know, as a child, I was very confused and upset with her, but I c don't blame her for, you know, she just, it wasn't her fault that she right. had these problems, but, um, yeah, at the same time, you just, it's such an odd way to grow up, I think, now that yeah. you find out how other people grow up and you see other families and you go, oh, you mean when your mom says that, that's what it means? Right. <laughs> that's so bizarre. How did you deal with it? Like when, when you know, you were dealt with the kind of the confrontation of of something that you know may have spiraled your mother, like mm -hmm. how, how, how did you deal with it as a, as a young lady? Uh, I decided not to show her my personality at all in any capacity. So I remained com as silent as I possibly could and as emotion free as I possibly could my entire childhood with her. And it took a lot of unraveling that when I got to be adult. The good thing about my situation is my parents were divorced. And so I lived with my mom from September to May and then lived with my dad in the summer. So and then my dad came. I, I saw my dad every other weekend during the fall and the winter and the spring. So I had a lot of my dad, who's a really balanced, very regular, salt of the earth. What you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. Extremely predictable, very stable person. And then I would go back into this other world where I wasn't really sure what I was going to get from day to day. So I think because I had the stability, I was able to just shut it down mm -hmm. when I was with her to protect myself. Uh, but then, you know, in high school, I had a terrible trouble with alcohol. I had lots of behavioral problems, arrested, I was vandalizing people's homes. Mm -hmm. I was acting out really badly because 
I had repressed all the myself for right. so long to hide. I would hide from her. Sure. Uh, not like in the closet. I would hide myself. I would try to be um, invisible, you know, when I was yeah. in, when I was with her, because being invisible was a lot easier than confronting her. And, you know, when Bert and I were first married, so my mom has six divorces uh, in her life. I was only really in her life for two or three marriages. Uh, the rest of them, we're not, we don't talk anymore. But, um, mm. but um, when I was first dating Bert, I didn't know how to have an argument because I had no siblings. So I had no you're one. only child. I'm only child. Okay, yeah, we have yeah. that in common. Yeah, yeah, we do. I, I, I get what you're saying. The the visible part. I'm like, yeah, it's like that's that's something a coping mechanism that only childs get. And I and I totally related to what you just said. I was like, oh man, yeah, that's me. Is that what you did? You yeah. just kind of disappear a little bit. Yeah. And that way you let them do whatever they're gonna do, and then you can kind of. I'm a really good at assessing people and behavior as an adult. I think more so than most people because you have to assess what's going to happen today. <laughs> yeah. Right? Wow, yes. It makes you observant in a very different way. In a, in, in a way that I wish I can shut it off. Like, Yeah, I'm, me I'm, too sometimes. Because it's too much. I'm seeing too much and I'm understanding somebody too much. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, I, I wouldn't say that I'm right 100% of the time, but it's like, I trust my instinct and I hate it, you know? Was, and then you cut yourself off sometimes to protect yourself or I do where you just <laughs> yes. shut it off and you go, all right, well that's out. And I've had to learn. I've had to consciously oh, yeah. say, that's so funny. okay, <laughs> this person is not my mom. This person and I are not jiving in this one way, mm -hmm. but all these other ways are great. So you're okay. Know what the thing is. That's like giving you trouble and know where to put that. So that you can have a relationship because for a long time I had no girlfriends, mm. no girlfriends till my early thirties. Cause I was like, I do not understand or trust anything that a, a, a girl is saying because of my mom. Oh, specifically because it was your mother. Oh, I see. Cause it was my mom. And so all of that, my mom was, um, very manipulative, uh, very um, sexually manipulative, very sneaky, lying. She would lie uh, to me and I would watch her lie to other people. And then I'd say, mm. hey, I don't think that's right. And I'd get in trouble for asking her about the lie. So my perception of women is that they were all conniving, lying, can't trust them. Sure. What you see is not what you get. And today's mood is not tomorrow's mood. And so, you know, teenage girls have a lot of that also. Mm -hmm. And even though they're just developing and figuring out who they were, right. my basis was that's the way women are in relationships. And I don't do that. And then my dad lived with two other guys. He had two other roommates. And, you know, they're just the most basic, let's drink a beer on a Saturday group of men. And I was like, that's what I'm talking about. Right. I know exactly what that is. I can sit around, and drink beer and talk to guys all day long. But girls... Cause yeah. it, it was almost like when you went to your father, it was a, it, it was a way for you to charge your batteries in a sense, right? To, yes. To prepare yourself again to deal to to have the undertaking of understanding and showing up. Yeah. Uh, for your mother, it yeah. sounded like. Yeah. It, it's like so you 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 had an emotional caregiving relationship in a certain sense because you knew what not to do to kind of yes. spike her mentally. That's right. Wow. Just stay under the radar. Mm -hmm. And do whatever she said to a point. I did fight back with her a little bit. She A couple things where I would dig my heels in and go, no. And it was yeah. so awful. Um, so. But in retrospect, those things that you, that one chooses to fight back on, I think in the long run, even though it, it is painful because it's like we're, we're, we're younger. We not, we're not equipped with the tools necessary to deal with that appropriately. But in, in, you did. It sounded like you did the best you could with with the tools that you had at the time, mm -hmm. and you're probably better for it now. It was like, yeah, I think the problem if I had never done anything, I would have really lost my sense of self. Yes. Right. So I picked things that for whatever, like my mom, 
my mom wanted me to be really girly girl and I was a big tomboy. Mm -hmm. I mean, just couldn't catch me dead in a dress <laughs> and no way. And I didn't care about doing my hair. I just wasn't a girly girl. I just wanted to be outside and dirty and, yeah. you know, I was just a tomboy and this one fight, I actually remember she wanted me to wear a dress for my school pictures mm -hmm. and I did not want to do it. And I was like, I'm not doing it. And she got really angry with me. And I said, finally, I'll wear the dress, but I'm not wearing those shoes. I'm wearing my shoes. And we kept fighting and I was not giving her the shoes. And I saw my class picture and I'm wearing this dress and these beat up red and black kids running shoes that okay. could not even possibly <laughs> go with that outfit yeah. because I've that I was not losing the shoes not I would just, for whatever reason that was something I was not willing to give up so I had a few things like that with her but yeah it does it makes it hard I think I had to when I was first dating married to Bert and we would argue as soon as we started arguing I would just leave the building like totally shut down like I have no I couldn't yeah. even formulate words in my head to tell him what was going on. Right. Because I had spent my whole life just shutting it down. Yeah. You know? Being quiet, too. I feel like it's like if, if, if there's level of uncomfort, it's like it, it, it was like, yeah, just like hitting the switches. Yeah. And it's like, well, say something. And I was like. What do you want me to say? I, exactly. I, I, I feel like anything I say, it's going to be wrong. Yeah. Be wrong and lighter fluid. It's like, I, I, I'd rather just let's wait this fire out. And then, you know, maybe when we're both cooled off, we could, you know, attempt this um, conversation again kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even do that. Oh, really? I would just go. My brain would go not understand what I was feeling. Couldn't put my feelings into words. And then I would just let it pass and eat it. Whatever happened, I'd just eat it. And that's heavy too, right? Yeah. Because we carry these things and it's like, we don't know when or where they're going to come out. Yeah, that's right. Wow. I think part of it's not having a sibling. You know, I didn't have anybody to say, hey, that's my doll. No, that's my doll. No, that's not. You know, there was no healthy argument. I never argued with my dad. My dad was just, if, if I ever got in trouble, he would very clearly go, I asked you not to do that. You did that. Here's the consequence. It was so very clear that mm -hmm. there was no, I never pushed back with him because. Yeah, I guess only childs don't really have the the back and forth that I think most kids with siblings have that it's like they can argue. They they have to learn how to stand up for, for us. It's like, uh, yeah, whatever someone says in our home, that's law and that's exactly. it. Exactly. And it cannot be broken. And then. That's so funny because that does kind of take you into this guilt territory, right? Mm -hmm. It's like living with a lot of guilt of like, oh, my God, I I can't believe I did the thing. And they said not to do that. Yes. You know, and you keep it to yourself. And you're like, hopefully they don't find out. But I did something they specifically told me not to do. And now you're carrying this burden of like guilt yes. over something that really wasn't all that important to begin with. Yes, because you had no peer group to work problems out with. Yeah, everything came from an authority. So you're always wrong. Mm -hmm. There was no space for me to be right. You know, when you have a sibling, I think there's times when you're right in the fight with your sibling. And there's times when you're wrong. But it's very different when your only conflict is with authority. Then uh, I think that's one of the reasons I rebelled so much in high school, mm -hmm. drank so much and got arrested, got in all that trouble because I was rebelling against this authority that I had had no voice against my whole childhood. Mm -hmm. um, it's complicated when you grow up with someone that has mental illness, you know, it yeah. makes your adult life really complicated. Yeah. Cause you have to kind of go back and, uh, and fix old things that should have been fixed a long time ago. So not only are you dealing with say your, your late teens or your early twenties and, and, and dealing and, and figuring out what that looks like, you're also still unboxing the other stuff at, you know, yeah, it's like you're you're behind on the un unboxing. <laughs> behind and we're way ahead because Oh, yeah. You know, you're way ahead in some ways. So far ahead that now you can't relate to your peer group either. That's the way I felt like in my twenties, is because I could see people pretty clearly and they couldn't see themselves that clearly, then I'd be like, Why well, I can't I can't have this with you because I can't have this conflict or mm. I can't have this conversation that's open yeah. and clear. Do you know what I mean? 
because you've spent this lifetime honing your ability to read people's body language and yeah there's a there's a part of the innocence that's gone mm -hmm. you know that that is like yeah uh being exposed to a certain element of of adult life and problems mm -hmm. at a very early age and having to solve them for um our adult uh um yeah the adult people in our lives it's like it takes away that that uh, element of that Innocence. Yeah. And then the freedom a little bit, right? Yeah. Some freedom is gone. Yeah. yeah. My dad, when my, my mom left when I was four for like a year and a half, she came back from time to time, but she left and my dad just bless his little sweetheart. He was so in love with her. He just fell to pieces. Mm. And, you know, you know that when you're four or five years old, you're running on nonverbal cues at that age. <laughs> yeah. You're not running on words. Mm -hmm. You're running on energy, energy yeah. and emotion and what you can visibly assess. You know, if your dad is sitting in a chair all night, not moving, not talking, not doing anything, and he's nervous, shaking his legs and hands, you go, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Um and when that happens when you're really young, I think it does take some of that. My dad would never have wanted that to affect me that way. Mm -hmm. but he was so torn up from her leaving that he couldn't manage himself properly, sure. you know, to have a little girl not be affected by that. He would never have done that on purpose, but he was just, you know, devastated. And yeah. it does affect you. It affects you forever and ever and ever. Yeah. It's one of the reasons that I married to Bert, I think, because... I am this table, I'm this table adult caregiver in his life, and that's kind of the role I'm comfortable with, sort of. Today's episode of Wife of the Party is brought to you by one of my favorite things on the planet, HelloFresh. HelloFresh, I have been using HelloFresh for so many years, I don't even know how long now. Uh, I love HelloFresh for so many reasons. I am not a good cook. Uh, I can follow a recipe really well, but I'm not a good natural cook. So if I'm going to cook anything that has any kind of interesting flavor, it's got to have a recipe. I, I don't have time to figure out what I'm eating. I'm working so much these days that just having a meal prep kit in my fridge that I can pull out with a recipe card, everything's portioned out, just needs to be chopped and prepped. And in about 30 minutes can have a delicious and fresh meal it just it just makes my life so much easier. And I love that my kids love HelloFresh and that they love to cook these meals. It's actually helped them learn how to cook in some ways. And I, I just can't say enough good things about our personal experience with HelloFresh. You can get farm-to-table quality with every HelloFresh box. HelloFresh's seasonal ingredients are picked at a peak of ripeness and travel from the farm to your doorstep in less than seven days for fresh flavor in every bite. They have new snacks, meals, and more to add to your weekly order, like their fun s'more bundle for kids. HelloFresh makes entertaining easy with a selection of crowd-pleasing eats like their bratwurst bar with caramelized onions, Dijonese slaw, and pineapple relish, or a snack board with pretzel bites, spiced bar nuts, and hot honey peach jam. You know what? If you get stuck in a recipe rut, you can take a bite out of something with the 40 recipes to choose from weekly with options to please even the pickiest eaters. You'll always find meals everyone at the table will enjoy. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Wife16 and use code Wife16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Wife16 and use the code Wife16 for 16 free meals plus shipping. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Wife of the Party is brought to you by Air Doctor. Air is everywhere. Did you know this? It is. It's totally everywhere. But air in LA can be a little polluted. And I have two dogs and three cats at my house. And I have a lot of beautiful flowers outside. And, and I have a husband who is allergic to all of the things that I just listed. An air filter has always been part of our life. From the very first moment we started living together, we bought an air filter. Air Doctor is an amazing 
air filter system. According to the 2020 census report, nearly half the population, almost 165 million people, are living in areas with unhealthy levels of ozone or pollution. That's LA. We take about 20,000 breaths per day. That's almost 3,000 gallons of possibly polluted air. Airborne allergens are the most common allergy triggers, such as pollen, pet dander, dust mites, and mold. I have all of those things, but maybe not mold because I'm in California. But all of those things I for sure have in my house. Bert has such a hard time um, sometimes taking a nap in the room where the dogs are until I started using our Air Doctor filter in there and it takes out all of those pet dander allergens for Bert. Air Doctor comes with a no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. So if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund minus shipping. So head to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code WIFE. And depending on the model, you'll receive up to 39% off or up to $300 off. Lock this special offer by going to airdoctorpro, A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com and use the promo code WIFE. And we've had this conversation before where it's like, I don't know if you recall, but it's like you and Bert have this very complimenting energy to one another. You guys complement each other so well. And, and, and yeah, when I, I'll never forget when we pulled up to Portland, when you guys saw the tour bus wrapped for the very first time, I I was the fly on the wall. (laughs) And I remember we got off of the SUV and it was parked right outside of the, the high school auditorium uh, venue. Mm -hmm. I forget what it's called. Um, But you guys walking together, like arm in arm, looking at it and looking at each other. It's like, there was so much being communicated back and forth. And it's like that, that, that is, yeah, that is what everyone strives for. I'm I'm, I'm telling you that energy. It's like, even how you guys communicate, it's like bird bird is, is like, being on that tour bus and seeing you guys together, it's like the way you guys dissect stuff, you got the the way you guys work together, the, the way you guys have fun, even in that work setting, it's like that's that means something. Aww, that thank means you. something for sure. So yeah, you guys have such a yeah, beautiful family. Like the, you're you know, I only know I only know what's on you know on, on, on social media and what I've what you guys have been kind enough to bring me along what I've seen. And it's like, and I know that a family unit will always have those problems and that's to be private and, you know, behind closed doors. But however you guys deal with that, it's, it's, it's beautiful because you could see the, the, the through line of love for it. For Aww, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Jesus. We are for, so lucky. I can't believe I found him. Um, I was, I, I don't even know how it happened. It's just, it was meant to be. It was meant to be, I think. We're a good match for each other. Um, and to be honest with you, he's so all over the place and so self-focused sometimes. He's not selfish, but he's a very self-focused person um, that he couldn't marry somebody that had a normal childhood, I don't yeah. think. <laughs> <laughs> right. He had to have That's somebody funny. who's used to somebody who's really self-focused, and my mom was really self-focused. Mm-hmm. So... She was also very selfish, and he is one of the most generous people on the very planet. Very generous. Uh, so that's not his thing. But I, I often think about, if not me, what kind of person, like all my broken parts mm-hmm. are what work in our relationship, mm-hmm. right? And so I don't look at them as broken parts anymore. I look at them as preparation, right? Mm-hmm. It was all preparation for this time when I'm so happy and— um I think to the outside, sometimes our relationship looks very out of balance, but I'm really happy in my relationship. So, right. and that's what's important. And everyone exactly. else's opinions or whatever is formulated is Matter. beside, way beside the it's point. Totally. You know? Yeah, it's it, it's out there, and it's like, what I I, re, I remember reading this somewhere. I can't remember where, but it's like the broken pieces. You know, it's like, you know whether it's family or whether it's like whatever you decide to take on, it's all part of this. Like it's like fragment. It's like a broken piece, but you know, especially when it comes to a relationship, I feel like it's like the broken pieces coming together because how else is the light supposed to get inside? Mm. It's like, you know, in, in, in terms of like building this vase 
where you put flowers and life comes out of it, right? Mm -hmm. There's two broken pieces that come together in some weird shape. This is broken in an odd place and this is broken in an odd place, but somehow they connect so perfectly and they make this vase, but how else is the light supposed to get in? Right. And it's like, and that's, I think. That's cool. You, you know, the Chrysler's are full of light, you know, for sure. We're definitely happy gr group of people. Happy bunch of people. Yeah. Um. Anyway, I don't think I let you answer the question I asked is, did you sense it as a kid that something was up with your mom? Yeah. You did. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Looking back, I, 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 I realized that I did and uh, I just dealt with it and how, how, however best I could, yeah. you know, and then, you know, with time, you know, it's like my mom's brain tumor led to this and to oh. that. And, you know, the caregiving went up even way before that, like my mom had like a double knee surgery kind of thing. And it's like, I remember that was a full on, like me being like bedside, you mm -hmm. know, h helping out because, you know, dad was at work and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that was like my first introduction to like caregiving and the in the traditional sense of like really like bringing somebody food and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, seeing somebody in pain and how old were you? Uh, middle school. Okay. Yeah. Early middle school for sure. So that was, uh, was it like sixth grade? That's young. Yeah. Sixth grade. In the, it's in a lot the, of responsibility. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, that's the only way I know, of course. Yeah, totally. you know? So it's like, I learned a lot. It's, it, you know, it's, um, you know, to be able to show up for them, you know, the way they showed up for me and not that I could ever repay, you know, no, like of one, course. but you know, it's like, a, I'm grateful in a way to have been there, you know, to, yeah. you know, every step of the way. And then, you know, the, the brain tumor led to this and that, and, you know, to, uh, sundowning, you know, de dealing with that, not understanding what that was. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like, um, mental health episodes where you're like, I don't know how to make sense of what's happening right now. And then seeing my mom now where, yeah, it's like, she's a completely different person mm. than I remember her. And mm. it's like, how is she different than how you remember her? Um, as she's, as she was approaching the state that she's in now, it's like, you know, you know, she would say stuff that was on her mind. She would say like some gnarly thing or a cuss <laughs> word or this and that. I'm like, Ma, that's like <laughs> you would never say that back then. <laughs> so now she was, you know, I walk in there. You want to, you didn't, you know what's wrong with you? I'm like, you're, you're about to tell me I for know. sure. Yeah, <laughs> like let's it hear not. it. Yeah, that's you know what's great. wrong with you, or, is it, or, 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 you know, you get to the point where, yeah, it's just whatever's on her mind. But also dealing with the thing of like she, she may not know who I am today. Right. You know, and that's that's tough. It's like that's like, I think anyone that deals with. um you know, it's like mental illness when, when there's situations like that, where reality is altered for your loved one, mm -hmm. it's tough because it's like, you're almost like uh mourning a person that was there and, and you, you're, you're mourning, not so much the person because of, I guess uh, the person is there, but it's the relationship that you had mm -hmm. that's gone. And you have to realize that that, that would never be what it was a week ago, a month ago, mm -hmm. five years ago, 10 years ago. Mm hmm 25 years ago. You know That's I mean? really great that you say that. That is what happens, mm -hmm. isn't it? My my mom's brother was schizophrenic. I was very close to him as a kid. Mm -hmm. And as he got older, his his um, disorder really progressed because he didn't want to take medication. So it just got worse and worse and worse. And I remember talking to him on the phone one day going, oh, I think he's gone forever. Like that makes me really sad. Mm -hmm. But I never really thought about it like grief. But I think it was. It was it's very grief. sad. He had eventually developed a brain tumor and, and died of brain cancer. But um, mm, I'm sorry. But yeah, I remember. Thank you. I remember the last time I talked to him on the phone thinking, oh, I don't think I'm ever going to talk to my Uncle Terry again. <laughs> I'm, yeah. just gonna, I'm just talking to this guy who is not making any sense at all. And I'm not even sure he knows who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I think maybe somewhere deep down he knew who I was, but yeah, talking out of his head. You 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 hold on to the to the version of the person that you uh, had the most joy with. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, and that's what you choose to hold on to, and and you just accept it. Yeah, it it, it definitely is a a, a a thing where you like, yeah, you're you're grieving the loss of a day to day loss. You know, especially with elderly people when you're dealing with somebody with a terminal illness or that kind of thing. You're 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 constantly grieving. It's like the mm -hmm the baseline from yesterday, you know, um, 
yeah, it's like the constant change. And, you know, it's like, what's the uh, a phrase? Uh, um, the phrase that's like the only constant thing in life is change. That's like, right. As soon as we understand that, it's like. It's easier. It's easier. And it's like, as a caregiver, it's like, I, you know, I talk about it in that documentary with ARP, but it's like, somehow I arrived at the idea. I was like, I remember reading books where it said, you know, it takes a village. Like the the saying that we hear is it, it takes a village to raise a kid. It's like, but in my heart, I do feel like it takes a village to a, to help somebody age gracefully. Mm. It's like, you want to soften the landing. It's like the first thing they tell you when a loved one goes into hospice, it's like, we're going to, you know, be in charge of maximizing this person's comfort in their, in, in, in their latter part of their year. And like, like, like the last part of their life, you know, it's like their focus in, in hospice is to make somebody comfortable. And I think, you know, what, what better thing than to have, um, the ability to 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 soften someone's landing, right? You know, it's I think gift. if nothing else, yeah, that's I, a gift. Yeah, it's a gift. So let me ask you this: I often think if I'd had a sibling, one of us would have ended up um, dead, serious addict, rageaholic, mm -hmm. some big problem like that, but because. I, I think maybe because of how I'm wired and that I didn't have a peer to be angry at for not pulling the load of dealing with the mom or mm -hmm. who was angry at me for not pulling the load for had no competition, I guess, for lack of a better word. I had no one else. It it definitely made me who I am today. But I wonder if I had a sibling, how it would have affected me. And I often wonder why I am healthy. Do you ever wonder those things about yourself? Of what would I be like if I had a sibling? Yeah. Or what what makes you, you are the nicest, kindest, most giving person. <laughs> you, you didn't come out of your life. Some people would have come out of your life going, that sucked. And I hate this. And my mom, that, and my dad, Oh, it blocked. sucks for sure. No, but, yeah, no, 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 yeah. I'm just invisible right now. I mean. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know what I mean? Yeah. That You don't walk around with that. Um, or I don't see that. If you, if you have it, I don't see it. What makes you like that? And how do you think it would have been different if you had a sibling or would it have been different? Yeah. I, I, the, so the reason I don't walk around with it is because it's like, I think we learn from an early age that 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 um, so, like you learn what uh, like dumping is like. You don't want to be the person that dumps all that on on somebody. Is like and, and you know having past you know relationships with you know like a working relationship or you know relationships in in all its form and in, in in different forms. It's like when you. Like you don't want to be known as a person that has that that heaviness all the time, mm -hmm. and also because you know where you go through, you don't want to be the person that's uh, pawning off that thing mm -hmm. on somebody else. So it's like it, it's almost like when you're outside of that specific situation, you almost like want to like cheer people up, or you know, it's like you know, I'm following stand up comedy. There's some kind of like uh, need that 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 uh, fulfills. You know, it's like seeing people laugh and. You know, I'm up there. It's like they have no idea what happened that day, right. that week, or what I'm dealing with. It's like, it's like all they know is that I'm telling some joke about mustard on stage, and they're like, "Oh, that's <laughs> silly." It's like, "Oh I like man," that joke, by the way. but you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it would be different if I had a sibling because, assuming that the relationship would have been good between, you know, a, a very nice relationship between a sibling, it's like you have somebody that kind of is in the know. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think there's a lot of, you know, articles and stuff that are is written most risk most recently you hear about like someone feeling seen. It's mm -hmm. like and I and, and I think somebody who is in or around your age within a, a a sibling age gap could give you that that visibility that I think most young people need mm -hmm. that keeps you from lashing out or, you know, picking up an addiction early on or that kind of thing. I I, I think that visibility kind of helps get it out with somebody that understands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can have that person to go. Yeah. Inside baseball, you could be like, exactly. hey, my, my mom said the couch is uh purple today. Oh, okay. 
thanks for telling me. I'll, 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 I'll be sure to walk in. So you have kind of like your your cut man, you know, right. or cut woman that, that can support you in that way. Yeah. I think that too. I often though think that my sibling wouldn't have made it out alive. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I think that a lot. Not that my mother was this horror person. Sure. But she, I, she didn't beat me. It was nothing like that. It was just a big, constant mind fuck. Mm-hmm. And and I, it took me so long to unravel that and really figure out what was my voice and what wasn't her voice and mm-hmm. what was my choice and not her choice because everything had to fit in her little box. And I just wonder, I wonder sometimes if they, I, how it would have been. Yeah. I, I would have loved to have had a partner in crime to do exactly what we said. Mom said the couch is purple today. Yeah. But I just wonder, it took so much for me to get yeah. myself on track from having grown up like that. I just wonder sometimes what it would have been like. I know now as my dad's getting older, I would love to have a, a, a sibling. <laughs> yeah. To have, again, going back to the support, it's like yeah. to have that support and it kind of falls on one person to figure out and yeah. two minds are better than one. So it's like in any situation from growing up to even now and, in, 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 um, you know, taking care of, your father now as as he's getting older it's like two minds of of course are better than are one are better than one yeah. yes i know my my closest friend is one of 5 and her mom's 80 and she just got hit by a car oh and she's okay, okay but she uh, fractured her pelvis and now now they're like okay she lives in a third story walk up in boston Mm. we got to move her somewhere and if there's five of them working on it and i was just reflecting going wow if that happened to my dad it would be all me yeah. and how nice is it to go you look for a caregiver you look for uh, assisted living you look for you look into insurance for this accident and they can each kind of take on a role and mm. i'm just the whole time being going wow that would just all be me. That yeah, would, I remember I'll be me. dealing with with the yeah for a long time. I was scared because we were in an apartment building that didn't have an elevator. They're on the second floor, and I just kept thinking if I'm on the road and God forbid there's an accident or yeah. um, an emergency where they have to run down, my mom would not go down those 17 steps. You know, every time I went up those steps, I was reminded of like you got to find a ground level apartment somewhere or yeah. a place that had an elevator and. I remember how big of a deal that was. But like you said, it's like if there was another sibling that's like, hey, uh, you call around today or I'll go look around or, or hey, I got a number I can't call today. Can you call? Yeah. Like that that divvying up or that team uh, effort, or like that team spirit of solving something would have been really cool. Yeah. So you taught special ed. I was an AB instructor for a little bit. What does AB mean? It's a behavioral therapist, like working oh, with kids with autism. That's right. And uh, I was, I was uh, for a year uh, out in the South Bay, I, I worked at this uh, agency that would go into schools. And we work with kids with autism from right around the, the time that they were diagnosed to like, I don't know, like um, the, the client that I work with specifically was age nine. So he was just because he was a bigger kid and... You know, sometimes there were like some uh, like tantrums that he would have. So it would be kind of hard to control. And all the other uh, instructors were like shorter, kind of <laughs> smaller people. So, I was, you know, I come in and, you know, uh, the client will look at me and, and we almost bonded right away. You know, yeah. there was some kind of unspoken kind of like, hey, like, you know, what's up, bro? Kind of thing. So um, I did that for a year, you know, right before I jumped into into um, wanting to do stand up. Like, yeah. Full time. What did you think about that job? Did you like it? Did you? I liked it. Yeah. I liked it. It was, it was, it was really cool because you get to meet the parents, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, and you can, you can see, you know, like the parent wanting their kid to, you know, do well and, and to find success within, you know, with the tools that they were equipped with, you know, to, to, to see how they can develop as a person. And mm-hmm. um, it was really cool. You know, I got to see kids that were nonverbal. That by my time there, my short time there, it's like there were there were improvements, you know, and you know I say massive improvements, but you know, and somebody and and maybe in an untrained eye, they would be like, oh, it's not really like a thing, but it's like massive improvements. You could see, you know, a young person's um, want to to excel and to improve, and 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 um, yeah, it was it, it was really cool, like you know, and also seeing some of the clients who who were laser focused on, 
on certain things. Like there was a, um, a student who, I mean, very young, but any flag that you showed the kid, the kid would know what country it is. And it was just like amazing. There was a, there was a young lady who could play the piano quite well. And, wow. and she was, I don't know, like six. Wow. And she had, I, I mean, it was, it was, she was young, but she could play, you know, some cool tunes, you know, and, and was motivated to like learn how to read music. I mean, there was a challenge there, but yeah, it was, it was really cool. It was very fulfilling. And yeah. I, and, and I realized that my, my, my level of patience was, was, um, perfect for you know you got to be very patient so mm -hmm. i was like I, I was down to play ball of like if they didn't want to do something you know you got to follow through like i'm sorry we can't do this and you know they'd be upset and we have to redirect our attention to something else mm -hmm. um but yeah i i really enjoyed it and i think if if stand-up wasn't in the picture i think i would have stuck with it maybe find um you know get my master's in it you know to properly um service you know this side of education that I think is sometimes overlooked, Just, yeah, totally you know, when overlooked, budget yeah. cuts happen, it's like, that's unfortunately mm -hmm. oftentimes some of the programs that get, you know, budget cuts the, you know, right away. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's insane because I do, again, as a caregiver now, it's like, I, I, I know what, what that entails, but you know, when you have a parent or a family who has kids under, under that circumstance, it's like, Oof, they're they're just starting life and you know they they have a few odds stacked against them so. yeah and they need the support right yeah it's hard enough to be a parent of kids that don't have challenges yeah but to, you know i know with isla has a learning disability which is not the same as autism but it's similar in that you have to learn how to to be effective with the kid right mm -hmm. it doesn't help to say the same thing over and over again if no. there's no effect. No. So the tools I would imagine that you have when you're trained to work with a kid that has autism just shortcuts that, you know, getting to effectiveness. Yeah. And that would improve the life of families so much. It is just a shame they cut all that funding. They yeah. are one of the first ones to go. What did you learn from that about yourself or what did you learn about life from working there? That everyone does it. In their own way and that's okay you know it's like just i i will forever remember this uh single cell cartoon strip right and uh one of the one of the main people in the office uh she she was someone who i reported to and and she was working i think on her um on her phd in education you know she was like really um but anyway she had this this single cell cartoon um picture on her on her door um you may have seen it on like social media but it's a bunch of animals lined up in the uh, yeah a bunch of animals everything from like a giraffe an elephant down to like a goldfish in this bowl and um and they're like uh, who's gonna climb this tree right so not everyone could climb the tree right, right? Some people can appreciate the tree. Maybe the goldfish could appreciate what the tree was, but maybe not climb it. The giraffe was able not to climb the tree, but still got a full scope of the tree because you can get up there. And and then there was other animals. Like it, it, like I remember just sitting with that and understanding it. And I think that that in a way is is what I walked away feeling of like being respectful of somebody's way of of achieving the thing it doesn't have to be one way and it goes back to our only child thing it's like there was only one way that we seal up the cereal box and that's what it was and if you folded the cereal box the other way that that was not correct and you're gonna get in trouble mm -hmm. so it's like it kind of eliminated it freed me from this um being in trouble part you know right. it's like you know we have to do the thing but if, if there's a different way you want to do it then you know let's let's look at that and, and see how we can go about that you know isn't that interesting? I think when you, what you just said, when you grow up with a parent that, or a parent, when I grew up with my mom, the way she was, I didn't think there were options other than hers. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's, that, that's it. Uh -huh. We, we, we realize that there's options. And I think for only children, sometimes the word option is not really in our vocabulary ever. And, no. and, and we have to learn that later. So yes, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's it. Yeah. Options are, Yeah. 
it, options are so fun when you start thinking, well, I can do this any way I want. Yeah. Sometimes it can be overwhelming when you have too many options, especially when you're used to not give, being given any. Yeah. And then you have a different problem. It's like being indecisive and that goes yeah. into like uh-huh. uh, uh, confidence, yep. you know, when you have so many options, you're not used to now you're overstimulated. Yep. And that's quite, quite um, draining, you know, it's, it's draining because now you're, you're dealt with having to make more decisions than you had to do before. Mm-hmm. And I think as only children, we do uh, find ourselves in spaces where we're socially exhausted. Like mm-hmm. we can't be in, in a room full of a lot of people or uh, because of that, you know, mm-hmm. it's like you have a lot to think about when before it's like, do this. It's like very, I guess, mindless where you're just like, you do this, you do that. That's it. And then you sit down, you know, that's yeah. it. It's very Whatever. rote. And yeah. you are used to being by yourself, no peers. That's interesting you say that because at a certain point in our marriage, uh, I figured out that Bert recharges his batteries by being with people and mm. I recharge my batteries by being by myself. And invisible, I love people. Yeah. I'm yeah. super social. Yeah, I love people. And but- at a certain point, I got to go sit in a room by myself. I just need to go be by myself. It doesn't even have to be long. Mm. But if I don't do that, I start getting really irritated and really reactionary. Like, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah. And if I just peel off (laughs) and go sit in the room by myself for a little bit, Uh I'm all good. (laughs) I don't meet a stranger. You know, I'm super social. But I just don't. He actually, when he's by himself, it makes him depressed and <laughs> yeah. sad and drained and not me. Yeah, I think that, uh, wow, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think w- we have so much in common. I'm, I'm like, we yeah, it, it, it's so funny because I can clock out or just Homer sends them into the bushes and it's just like, I'm out of here. And I, I can be in that bush all day long, just ha- happy by myself, uh-huh. you know. And I have never met a person that ended up not being a friend in some way, you know, it's yeah. like, I'm, I strike up a conversation anywhere. And, hey, you know, what's yeah. your favorite color? And they're like, who's this guy? It's like, <laughs> and we leave, you know, hugging it out, you know, but I, I, I have to, you know, my girlfriend, you know, Adria, she's so supportive in that way. I think she, she came to understand is like, oh, he just needs to, like, I can't even watch TV. Like, mm-hmm. like it just the noise is overstimulating for me. Mm-hmm. Um, then I get like, I can't even see people in the eye sometimes if I'm overstimulated. It's like, it's like the sensories of like hearing and this kind of that. So I have to remove myself and then I recharge and then I'm like, I'm now, back, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? I oh never really God. thought about it being from being an only child, but that totally makes spent sense. I spent so much time by myself as a kid. Do you, did, did you read, uh, did you read a lot as a kid? A lot. Okay. Did yes. you? Yes. Yes. I'm putting two and two together. You know what? I I found myself growing up in a library like that. That essentially was my upbringing a a, a library, right? Uh, but the reason was is because that was the first place. Like my mom would like leave me there sometimes to go to work. You know, sometimes it, despite working multiple jobs, both of my parents, it's like they couldn't afford a babysitter sometimes. Sure. So. You go and they drop you off and you're there. But that was, as, as we're having this conversation, I'm making sense of one thing. And it was like the first time as a young person when you're able to make your choice. And that's that. I can go grab a book from here and over there. And I'm going to read the stories that I want. And if I want to go reread the same Clifford book 18 times over in one day, I can do that. There's nobody breathing down my neck going, you have to read this book or that book. It became fun. That's interesting you say that because that was that way for me too. My mom actually would say to me, I don't know why you're reading. It's a waste of time. Uh, But my dad would say, you can't have a toy, but you can have a book. Any book, you choose it. If we ever went to a store. And so that was my, I never thought of that, Jesus. But you're right. No one told me what I could read. You curated your own path into yeah. stories. And um, it, w- it, it was such a big deal. So again, not having command of the English language, my only exposure to books was that little itty bitty bookshelf off to the side in a library with Spanish books. Mm-hmm. So I'm self-taught, mm-hmm. you know, to read Spanish. You know, it's Spanish is a little easier to read than English. You know, it's, you know, you, you write it. You read it the way it sounds, you know? Yeah. So over time, I was able to get command of it, but that was essentially the launch pad. I was motivated to figure out the rest of the library 
Uh, I, I grew up in Long Beach, right by the main uh, library branch, which was a couple blocks away. So even in my off time, I found myself going down there. They had everything I I I, I was interested in, like mm-hmm. books on anything. If, if if I that was the internet, you know, it's like people yeah. talk about Chat GPT. The librarian was the original Chat GPT. They yeah. were our, our first influencers, uh-huh. you know, and a kid could really feel visibility, like feel seen, because you go to the librarian is like, oh, I, you know, as a, you know, eight year old kid or ten year old kid walks in there, I want a book on on dinosaurs and robots. All right, well, let's get you the robot one first and let's get you the dinosaur. But you can find the thing you were looking for and that felt really good. Mm -hmm. And you're literally lost in in, in the book. Yes, escapism. Escapism in the the perfect way Mm -hmm. because you're learning a ton. Mm -hmm. After a while, you have some proficiency in how to find books, you know? Mm -hmm. So Spanish books led to me discovering the rest of the library, right? And then I remember downstairs... At the main branch, they had um, they had uh, these uh, uh, TVs with the VCR thing, like, and uh, for twenty five cents you can check out a, a VHS tape, and you go watch a movie, you know. And then they had a bunch of there. You put the headphones on, and you were watching. So I I, I watched a lot of like documentaries, uh, nature shows, and eventually found my way into um, uh, stand up comedy. No I, would, I, would, I would watch the specials there. And of course, that would not be something I could watch at home. My parents don't understand what they're saying, but they do understand certain cuss words. I'm like, hey, what's going on over here? Right. This, this is shut down. I, I could not even explain to them that it was, they heard a bad word and it's like, you know, it's like, it's done. So again, it was a it was the only and first place I was able to make decisions for myself. And it was like a safe space. Why for the Party is brought to you by True Classic. Uh, Father's Day's coming up. And, you know, my kids used to go to a big box store and buy T-shirts for Bert. And Bert would hate them because invariably they would be too short for his belly or too skinny for his shoulders. And they just never fit him well. And he always hated Father's Day because he knew he was going to get this T-shirt that never fit. Well, True Classic is made for guys like Bert. Their t-shirts are a great fit for real-looking guys. And finally, you have an excuse to throw away baggy boxy tees. If there's one thing these guys are good at, it's a great-fitting t-shirt for guys of all shapes and sizes. True Classic shirts are ultra-soft and fitted in the arms and shoulders with just enough room where they need it for the perfect fit and feel every time. Gift more for less on bundled packs of button downs, Henleys, polos, and more styles he'll want to wear on repeat, guaranteed. But it doesn't stop there. From their latest comfort jeans and chinos to no-ride boxer briefs, True Classic is your one-stop shop for all his wardrobe needs, bringing that same dedication to fit and feel to everything else he needs to get dressed. What a great, great place to shop for Father's Day. True Classic is hooking our listeners up with an exclusive deal to help you get ahead on gifting. For a limited time only, get 25% off with the code WIFE at trueclassic.com. That's 25% off with the code WIFE, plus free shipping included on purchases over $100. Wife of the Party is brought to you by Babbel. I mean, 15 minutes a day. What would you say if I told you you could learn a language in 15 minutes a day? 15 minutes a day, everybody has. If you're going on a trip, if you want to start watching foreign films in a different language, if you're just curious, hey, can I learn a language? I bet if you try Babbel 15 minutes a day, you will be shocked at how quickly you can learn a new language. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and your accent. Babbel's expertly crafted lessons are built around real life. You learn how to have practical conversations about travel, relationships, business, and more. Personally, I like Babbel because it's just 15 minutes of my day and it's really easy to follow. I don't have a natural ear for language, but Babbel just makes it Because it is so applicable to -to day-to-day life, it makes it really easy to learn. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash wife. 
That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash wife for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, it's language for life. So what? whose specials would you watch? Who do you remember watching? I remember, I remember in high school, I was already like, I was fascinated with like Def Jam, you know, because mm-hmm. it was like a series and it was the first time the reason I bring that one up is because it's like it was the first time I was able to see comedians not do like it was a, a, a hour special, mm-hmm. you know, it was five minutes mm-hmm. and I was like so blown away by that. Mm-hmm. And I would watch them over and over again. And um, yeah, it was it, it was like any comedy movie that I that I wanted to to see that my parents would not let me rent, you know, for whatever reason. But you, know, I would go down there and. One thing led to another. It's like I was a uh, super over time. I remember uh, going into like, like Seinfeld. Yeah, Seinfeld was like a big one for me. Um, Don Rickles, I thought was very funny because oh. he was like, he was like, how is he mean to people? And people are like laughing. I'm like, that is, and I related to that because that was a sense of humor. You know, my family had it was it was this very heavy roasty sense of humor, and I was like. He does it, but like way better. And he's yeah. wearing a suit and he's like a, a chunky guy with a great smile. Yeah. But Don Rickles, I love. Do you like Don Rickles as well? Love Don Rickles. Yeah. He's hysterical. Oh my God. And he is mean, but not mean at all. He's so mean, but he's mean to everybody. So then he's no longer mean. He's so mean that the needle went back to loving. You know? Exactly. Like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I love Don Rickles. That's yeah. so funny. Stephen That's so Wright. cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. So did you go to work with your dad at all? I did. <coughs> As a landscaper? Yeah, my dad, uh, you know, worked construction and, you know, had a landscaping business. And growing up, it was all like, you know, I had to work, you know, e- either my parents. You know how most kids are like excited to get picked up from school early? I was not. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Did that mean it. you had to go yeah. to work? Yeah, I was like, dang it. You know, we're about to go to work. Yeah. And um. And I was like, I want to stay. He was like, no, we got, you know, you, you, I need some help, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, it's just, you know, as a first generation, you know, I, I, I think that's kind of the, the responsibilities that come with being a first generation, you know, it's like, you need some help, you know, it's like, so, you know, your family is, is, is the unit that comes together to help, you know, my mom, you know, she would pack us lunch and then she would go to work and she, so everyone's helping each other to kind of like rise, you mm-hmm. know, it's like, um, but yeah, working with my dad, it's like mowing lawns from a young age. And I did that. I, I took it over when my father got sick. Uh, I took over the landscaping company for a bit there. Um, but yeah, like my whole life was behind a mower and I used to, you know, take, um, a skateboard with me, you know, I'd, I'd take a pencil to go draw. I was like obsessed with drawing and, and writing like, just like funny stories or whatever that would go along with the pictures and. I put them up inside the the work van, you know, all over, and um, yeah, and yeah, it was it was a big big part of my 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 upbringing. Is that what your little your book's about? Yeah, my book is is exactly about that. It's um it's called Papa's Magical Water Jug Clock, which is kind of an inside joke that my dad and I had. So cute. Um, my dad had this massive water jug. And, uh, um, like the Gatorade water jugs. Yeah. Like the Gatorade water jugs you see on a football game that they tip over, you know, the construction worker kind of the, kind of sits in the back of the truck. So my dad had one of those and we would fill it up with water. And, uh, he convinced me that he was able to tell time based on how much water was in there. Oh my God. And I was like, man, is that true? He goes, absolutely true. And, uh, he's like, and then when the water's gone, that's, how I know exactly when it's time to go home. I'm like, wow. So I took that at face value and I would start wasting water left and right. <laughs> <laughs> I was filling up dog bowls at different houses that we went to. And, uh, you know, 10, 1030 comes around. And it's like, dad, we got to go home. The water's gone. <laughs> He's like, you dummy. I, 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 I do that to make work fun kind of thing, you know. And um, that's basically the story depicted here in the book. And, you know, the idea that time and money is... Uh, very precious. It, it it shouldn't be wasted. Is 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 the lesson there? Time and money are precious, and they shouldn't be wasted. No, time and water. I'm sorry, I said money. Time and water. Uh, yeah, time and they water are, are both. precious. 
This is so cute. All the drawings too. You didn't draw the drawings. No, I, I did not. Eliza Kinks uh, did the the drawings, and it was just so amazing. Um, Maria Russo, my wonderful editor, she uh, paired us up together, and it was just like her her style is so funny. I think it's like. Visually, you could see like a visual punchlines and all that good stuff in there. And she's just so amazing. And, you know, Maria Russo and team. And, you know, there's a good team back there who, who, you know, have, have helped get that book out there. And, you know, it comes out June 6th. So it's June 6th. Uh, yeah. So it's almost there. You know, Deborah and Lynette have worked very hard. Uh, it, it, uh, so, so we already got like three stars uh, uh, reviewed. We got one from Reader Digest from awesome. uh, Kirkus and, um, we have another one that's coming out too. So we already got like three stars, which is really special. And I was able to go to Austin like a, a couple of weeks ago to um, uh, the Austin Librarian Association conference and got to meet like all of my best friends, uh, all the librarians from Texas. And, you know, it was just, uh, it was so cool and to see this book resonate with a lot of them and, and, you know, I remember speaking to one librarian who was like saying that she uh, grew up working with her dad and it reminded her of it, you know, and she's like, I hated working with my dad, but little did I know those were some of the most special times I had with my dad. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, yeah. As, as a kid, you hate it, but it's like one of those special times that you have with your folks. So It is. I worked with my dad too. Oh, really? I did. I started working with him when I was, I guess, 13 and I worked with him all through high school. What, what was your father's business? He uh, is an auto mechanic. So oh, he had his own shop. Nice. So I started out just paying his bills and keeping his books and writing his invoices and collecting. And then I started um, running parts for him. So I'd go to and from the parts store mm -hmm. and I drove his tow truck Oh I'd pick up goodness. cars in his tow truck. <laughs> so I drove a tow truck a little bit. But yeah, I worked with him for a few years. It was really great. I learned so much about business, mm -hmm. just doing the basics of business, which is writing out invoices and balancing mm -hmm. his checkbook. You know, that applies to any business you have. Yeah. So it was really great, too. It was really fun to be with them, uh, you know, after school. I really enjoyed it. You enjoyed being being there for the day-to-day -day business? Was there any times where you're like, I don't know, this is a lot, or it's like you enjoyed oh, it for yeah. the most part? Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. I was, you know, I was a teenager. Yeah. There were times where I didn't want to do it. But my overall feeling when I look back mm -hmm. is I'm really grateful. Yes. Yeah, because yeah. I got to spend time with him in a different way than just being at home you know yeah. he's working and he was teaching me so much responsibility i mean our kids work for us here it's not exactly the same sure but they do work from time to time georgia is a pa when she's home every time we shoot something's burning because i want her to to work and to see kind of what we do yeah for work so they can kind of put two and two together and not just think mom and dad are off doing some uh, you know, thing they can't really wrap their head around. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I loved working with my dad. Yeah. So that's cool that that's what the librarian, you know, resonated with that part of it. What, what, what gave you the idea to write the book? I've always wanted to write one. I've, I've, I, uh, you know, as a kid, I would do like little booklets and that kind of thing, but it's like, I've always loved to doodle and draw and write, you know, and, and um, I wanted to like write a book that that um, I can see myself in, you know, you know, you know, honor my parents and my upbringing. And, um, you know, this book is also being released in Spanish, which was really oh, cool. It's great. Yeah. So the name of that one, the the title translated to El Barrilito Magico de Papa, which was really great. And my girlfriend served as a, a cultural consultant and, and translator to the book. And, um, yeah, both, both versions are like amazing and, 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 and that they, that I'm able to get my, my, my story and talk about this experience, which is like all too common in, in communities of, of people that look like me, but mm -hmm. you know, it's never really seen in a book. And I think it's really cool to, you know, much like when, when someone sees a movie, it's like you either relate to it or you're drawn into it and you learn something from it. So I think a lot of people will relate you know, with my background, but at the same time, you will learn a little bit about, you know, that gardener you see on Saturdays with, with, with their kid out there push, uh, pushing a lawnmower. It's like, um, 
I, I, I wanted to, I was motivated to write this kid's book as like a funny thing. You know, I didn't want to like kind of hang my head on this kind of like, like when you read the book as an adult, you're like, oh, there's a lot going on. You could, you could see w- like the loaded environment, mm-hmm. but it's like, my focus is always comedy and, you know, cheering, uh, you know, yeah. Trying to bring laughter to, to, to the reader, to the kid listening to the story. Um, but I, I've always wanted to do it. So it's like a childhood dream come true to have the book. And we're already working on a second title. Um, I, I'm so grateful for all the great reviews so far that, that have like people have taken time to really read it. We, um, read it and, and, and write these reviews and, and this is all ahead of the release. So it's like, I'm so grateful to have landed in this space when I did, you know, it's like, and I, and I see myself doing this for like forever. Just, like I, I, I put this book like neck and neck with like having my hour special. Like, no way. That's like everything that came out of, you know, my years in, in the library, you know, it's like reading say, joke yeah. books, watching specials, reading books. It's like, I think I was able to kind of like, you know, contribute to that. Like, like to, 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 to have, a book on the shelf at, you know, at a library would be really cool, you know, really cool. Especially now knowing how much the library meant to you. Yeah. That's it's, amazing. It's, it's it's big. Yeah. It's yeah. It's a, an amazing place. And, you know, to have my, my little, my little drop of sand in the bucket is, you know, means a lot for sure. It's so cool. It's really awesome. And I like that you wrote about the gardener Yeah, because you're, you know, L.A. especially, everybody all, everybody has a gardener yeah. out here. And uh, I didn't grow up with a gardener back home. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just so cool. I, I love that you did this. I can't wait to read it. I'm going to have to buy some. I have nieces and nephews. Oh, well, that's your copy there. I uh, wanna, no, yeah, this yeah. was for me. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. This was not for them. Yeah, okay, <laughs> this yeah. was for me. <laughs> so I have to buy the. Where can I buy one? Uh, you can get. Uh, you can pre-order on, on um, bookshop.org. You know, I, I usually buy my books from there. They do a really cool thing where they help out independent bookshops and, you, you know, provide, uh, yeah, it's like some some traffic and sales to local bookshops. They, you know, so bookshop.org, you can go to Amazon or Barnes and Nobles, wherever you buy your books, but it's uh, for pre-sale uh, wherever you get books. That's and, awesome. Yeah, they'll be Wait, in stores June 6th. June 6th. What is bookshop.org, you yeah, said? Yeah, bookshop.org. And they, they it's a really cool... Um, uh, bookstore that I usually buy books from because it's like uh, they they do really cool things to keep uh, local bookshops you know afloat and 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 thriving and that kind of stuff. So um, if you can you know shop shopbookshop.org you know but if not you know wherever you get books. That's awesome. You know I always thought when I lived in New York City I moved to New York I was there for four years and I um, was very lost. When I lived there, I was just mm-hmm. a lost little soul. And uh, I would go to two places when I felt lost, St. Patrick's Cathedral and Barnes & Noble. Yes. Because Barnes & Noble was so big mm-hmm. that you could just get lost in that store. And I would, st- and I couldn't afford a book. And I was far from the library, mm-hmm. uh, but I was close to Barnes & Noble. Yeah. So I would spend a, so much time in there just going through books. And, you know, I never made the connection until you said today that my love of books might have been my my way of having some autonomy in my house, mm-hmm. you know, of having choices and options and autonomy. Because I love books so much. The fact that you can bring them home. Yeah. It felt it made you feel responsible. Remember the 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 envelopes with the due date slips? Yeah. You know, they stamp them. You're like, all right, I got to take it back on this day. There was fines involved. You're like, damn, I got to pay 25 cents each day. It's like, that's like a dollar 25. Like, I know. You know, it, it was just so much around a book. A, 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 a book gave you so much like a sense of, yeah, just choices and yeah. an accomplishment. Accomplishment. You can you finish, finish something. Yeah. yeah. You felt like you'd really done something and you learned something or you felt something or you went somewhere. I loved books. Oh, my God. You know, even to take it even further, yeah. my favorite books was the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Oh, my God. Yes. Right? So good. Because you can read it again and you're like, I'm going to take a different turn here. Exactly. <laughs> Talk about options. <laughs> yeah. You're like, in every chapter, you have two options at yeah. least. I'm going to get a little crazy here and read it again. I know, right? Take the other turn. I know. (laughs) I love those books because I could choose my own adventure. It was really awesome. Yeah, those are really cool. I remember reading some of those. It was like more like Spider-Man type of novels. 
And it was just like, wait, there's more than one story in the same book? Right. You know, it's like, it, it was just fascinating. Like, like the idea of whoever came up with that was like. <sighs> I know. I wonder who did come up with that idea. It was really, really That'd be good. really cool to find out. Yeah. I, yeah. I got to look that up. I'm, I'm curious now who the first person to kind of do something like that was. Choose your own adventure. Because yeah. you could have literally like hundreds of different stories hundreds in one them, book. Yeah. Depending on what turn you took. Yeah. Um. So are you on the road now? Yeah, I'm on the road now. Um. Uh. Actually, I'm, I'm I'm taking a a, a break. I I I got this project that I'm doing for the next couple of months, but I'll be back on the road in uh, in August, from August to December. So those dates are still kind of rolling out. And uh, right now we're just touring. We're going to be in Milwaukee for the for the Kids Institute uh, uh, conference. You know, for the book. Uh, that's um, in Milwaukee, Chicago for the American Librarian Association. So we got into that. That's kind of the the bigger one there. And uh, yeah, we have a bunch of events. So I'll be touring with the book um, in between while I'm doing this project. Uh, Libby's bookstore in Santa Monica, I'll be doing like a, like a book signing thing here in the, in the coming month or two. That's great. So I'm, 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 I'm really excited that, you know, you know, we got some more conferences that, you know, we got into these conferences and uh, yeah, I get to talk about, you know, talk about the book. And so, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's great. So where can people find you? Uh, JesusTrejo.com, J-E-S-U-S-T-R-E-J-O.com. I'm on Instagram as well. Uh, Jesus Trejo, the number one. Um, yeah, all my dates I usually post on my website calendar, and then I post on my Instagram all the time with uh, upcoming shows and that kind of thing. So, Well, I've seen you do stand-up a lot. I haven't seen you in a long time because mm-hmm. you haven't been with Bert, and I don't see I don't ever go anywhere to see anybody but Bert. But um, you're so funny. You're very sweet. Thank you. And you're so genuine on stage. Thank you. It's a play. I always just have always enjoyed watching you. Thank you. You're really, really funny. Um, So if anybody's looking for a good time, (laughs) go see Jesus because you are so funny. You're one of my favorite people, really. You're very sweet. Thank you so much. And I I, I can't thank you enough for for. Uh, the support and the love um, that you, the the Kreischers, have 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 shown me. It's you know, um, yeah, for, you know, I'm working with with Bert from like, you know, clubs to like when he did the theater tour, and then you know through the pandemic. So it's like you guys allowed me to provide for my folks, and I that, that I, I I could never repay you guys. So all I can say is thank you. Well, no repayment necessary. It was uh. It was mutually beneficial to watch you grow and just do your stand up. I just love stand up. I love yeah. I love the whole world you guys are in. It's a great great world of good people. I think stand up comedians sometimes get a bad rap. They're all miserable, unhappy people and that's just not true. Yeah. Not not in our circle anyway. Maybe yeah. it is true outside our circle. Sure. But our circle is all just good you, Shane Torres, Love Mark, Shane. Norman. Mark Norman. All these guys are just good people. Yeah. And, um, and nothing made me happier than to know that you and Shane had uh, had <laughs> weren't touring with Bertie anymore because you were headlining yourselves. And I was like, that's what I'm freaking talking about. That's what's supposed to happen. That's amazing. It's yeah. all we ever want. Yeah, we're just, we, you know, we've, we've talked about it, too. It's just, just being grateful that, you know, you know, somebody like Bert was kind enough to put us in front of their audience that they worked so hard to build. You know, that that means something. It's like the 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 love that an elder stand up comic has for like a younger comic of like that took a long time mm-hmm. to build mm-hmm. and it was not easy. Mm-hmm. And to, you know, reach out and and be like, hey, I would love for you to open. I, I think that's the biggest compliment mm. that that as as young comics we can take lightly, mm-hmm. um, because no matter what the size of that audience is, it's like the the fact that they're willing to bring you on to something they work so hard to get. It's like it's a big deal, and to to be able to like to be given the space to sharpen your wings and to really like grow them out, and it's like all right, go for it, you know, right. and hopefully kind of pay that forward and you know mm-hmm. it's like you know in, in martial arts i've noticed that there's always this kind of like really cool thing where they keep track of the lineage it's like i studied under so-and-so who studied under so-and-so and it can be traced back it's like you know it's like that 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky that, that I was able to be, you know, in that lineage of like, you know, having gone on the road with Bird and so many other comics that were so kind enough to right. take me on the road. And that, that means something because mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it's a learning, it's a learning experience so much from the inside out, the business side of it, seeing how he moves with after the show, during the show, the writing, the, also the hang, which is very important. Like you said, for, for Bird, it was recharging, you know, mm-hmm. seeing how somebody recharges and um, seeing how he works with his, uh, with, you know, with you, you know, it's like, you know, seeing the whole family come together to, you know, make the dream work. Mm-hmm. So it's really cool. And you'll do that also. I hope to one day be you able will. to. Yeah. It's like, you know, I want to definitely bring friends and, you know, I do it when I can, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes clubs, I'm not at that place here where clubs are like, Hey, you know who you want to bring. But it's like, whenever I have that opportunity, I, I definitely do it. And, and e- even when I get to work with local comics, that's really cool too. Cause I get to meet some of the local guys, which is always so exciting to see, you know, comics that I have never crossed paths with, you know, to work in that setting. So yeah, all around it just, uh, it, yeah, it's a fun gig. It is a fun gig. And it's, I think it's one of the most important art forms we have the spoken word, a looking at life, mm-hmm. making it light, bringing some levity. And at the same time, it sometimes makes you think about things in a way you hadn't think, thought about them yeah. before and can affect change in a less threatening way than, you know, someone just telling it to you straight. Sometimes right. hearing it, you know, through the side door is yeah. the way that it affects the most change. Comedy is yes. really important um, yeah. to me for mental health and for, happy society you need to have some stand-ups to just keep it real and yeah be able to dissect certain things i think comedy is just so perfect it's uh you know you can sugarcoat some things but or or also just looking at it in a different way you're like oh man it's like it makes you understand certain things it's you know yeah the 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 simile or the metaphor the way a certain joke was crafted or told it makes you look at things in a very different way that otherwise you know it's like instead of a very linear kind of you know situation yeah that's cool well thank you so much for coming today i'm so excited about your book yes thank you so much for having me this means a lot uh um yeah thank you again and yeah i hope to see you soon we'll see you soon i'm sure yeah